before, and y'all know how much I love a good tree. So when I came across folks that believe every tree has a story too, I got excited. So joining us today is Chad Fletcher, co-owner of Superior Artisan Wood out of Tupelo. Hey, Chad. Hey, Rebecca, how are you? I am doing well, and it is known around here that I'm quite the tree hugger. I love our Mississippi trees. I do believe every tree has a story. So I am super uh, interested in what you guys are doing there with your business. But let's start with how you got into it, because not everyone just has a sawmill as kind of a side hobby that turns into a business. So, Chad, when did you first get into, into I guess, woodworking or trees or sawmilling, however you want to say it? Sure, Rebecca. Well, for, first, thanks for having us. We, we enjoy your program, and it's, it's an honor to be on with you. So, uh, yeah, I initially got started uh, somewhat by accident. Oh, I don't know, a decade or so ago, uh, we were going to build our home, and uh, I had always been interested in sawmilling and knew a little about woodworking. And uh, at the time, I thought it would be kind of cool to process some of my own timber from my own place for my own home. So, I bought a small manual bandsaw mill with which to do that, and um, well, did just that. And it wasn't wasn't too long after that we were getting a little bit of side work with it. And then uh, my 20 year career in a completely different industry began to wane, and I found myself kind of looking for something to do. Um, I was enjoying processing this urban timber, so I, I just started running with it, and that's that's kind of how we got started. So what's kind of your primary uh, focus there with a Superior uh, Artisan Wood? I mean, are you looking, do you supply like the lumber for to actually build the house? Or are you guys more of like into fun projects or additions within the house? Yeah, so we do a little bit of, of all of it. We don't do any like framing type lumber, like say pine two by four studs and thing of, things of that nature. Um, our products are typically a little more specialty type products. Um, we have a high focus on what we call urban wood in the industry. And urban wood specifically is, is, is timber that was not um, harvested with the intention of making lumber. So, so what we try to focus primarily on is all the trees that might come down for other reasons that happen to find themselves in a landfill at the end of their life. So we're, we're heavily focused on trying to salvage that resource rather than waste it, and that's the type of products we use. And so we make anything from, say, you know, a one-by-six piece of lumber uh, for a project up to, say, four or five-foot-wide slabs of wood for conference-type tables and things of that nature. So this idea of lumber landing in landfills is completely new to me, Chad. I don't know why. I mean, I guess if I think it through, I go, okay, well, they have to put it somewhere. Why wouldn't it end up in a landfill? But when you have your, you know, something cleared in your house or you have just a few trees removed that maybe they were a danger of falling on the house or whatever it may be or may have died, I mean, I guess I never really gave it much thought to what happens to them next. I figured whoever came and got them, Chad, was was going to use them for another purpose. So how much lumber is actually ending up in landfills? Yeah, and you're you're not unlike most people in that in that we you know, we typically as a population as a general society we we don't really give it a, another thought. We just know maybe maybe the tree has to come down out of our yard. Maybe it's a hazard. Maybe it's sick or whatever. And then you know once we once we remove it, we don't we don't really think about where it goes. It's it's more times than not it's looked at as a hazard or a task or even an expense rather than an opportunity. Um, so yeah. So we, you know, we like to provide an outlet um, to divert these things away from landfills um, every chance we can. So, and it doesn't matter, like, what kind of wood are we talking about? So it means any dead tree and in your backyard, or maybe not any, you probably have some ramifications or stipulations, Chad. Uh, but I was looking through your Facebook page there with Superior Artisan Wood, and it looks like, man, y'all take some wonky-looking trees and some trunks and some all kinds of things that I would have thought, no way someone would be able to sawmill that down into something usable. Do y'all take pretty much anything? 
We do. So that's kind of the area we like to hang around in. So, you know, we make lumber that looks more like traditional lumber that you might find at your local building supply. But what we like to fool around is, is in oddities and like big wide pieces, or maybe we even saw some root balls or real gnarly shaped burls and things of that nature. So we like to fool around with a specialty type wood. And then to go back to your question about the landfills. Um, so in the U.S. alone, annually, there are nearly 4 billion board feet of potential lumber that are discarded. So a board foot, Rebecca, is a unit of measurement in the lumber world that is something that is 1 inch thick, 12 inches wide, 12 inches long. That is one board foot. So if you can imagine um, annually discarded in the U.S. just from, say, municipality wood or yard wood, what have you, there's 4 billion of those. Uh, discarded every year. So if you took, say, let's say you took uh, 4 billion board feet of lumber, again, that's something one foot wide, one foot long, one inch thick, you could uh, set those things end to end from New York to Los Angeles 271 times every single year. That's crazy. And to think that it yeah, could be... Yeah, so we're it, talking about yeah. a huge resource that is so often overlooked and underutilized and that we're able to salvage that material and make beautiful pieces from it. And, you know, not only are we doing the right thing in salvaging this resource, but more times than not, they have a story. They're connected to a community, to a family, to some sort of a story. And we're able to continue to tell that story through the lumber or through the finished pieces that we're building. I feel like most people just don't know this is an option. I- I've said it before here on Good Things Chat. I'm a super sentimental type of person. I love the things in your home that have the stories that have been passed down or that you just have like that connection to. You know, it's the idea that things do matter. You know, like people say stuff doesn't matter. Well, it can matter. You know, if it has uh, a story or reason behind it. And I think some folks just don't realize that they have potential there in the wood that's fallen. They think if the tree's dead, then it's, you know, it doesn't have life after that. Is that incorrect? Well, I think you're absolutely right. Most people, most people do feel that way. Uh, and and, and it's, it's, uh, most people just don't, they don't give it a, a second thought. And so the The um, hard work, if you will, on our end is working within our community and then the surrounding communities and trying to raise awareness that there is another way. Um, A lot of people are familiar with the farm-to-table concept currently, whereby people are procuring produce and protein maybe as localized as possible. So if we just with a simple mind shift, if we begin to look at our urban wood in the same way, then uh, we all, we can all realize the tremendous benefit we have here. Do you just ride around Tupelo, Chad, you and your partner there, Superior Artisan Wood, and just think, man, all the projects we can make with all the wood that's, you know, looks like it's sort of lying around or not, or, you know, or, or you just sort of wait till it tips over or has to, you know, come up before you knock on door and say, I need that out of your driveway. Yeah, so we, like yourselves, are tree lovers in that we we don't like to fell timber. So felling timber is the act of cutting it down, and we we don't really we don't really enjoy doing that. So um, all the stuff we use or procure um, is is something that was bec- uh, going to be coming down either of natural causes or maybe it was in the way of pr- progress. Like say, for instance, we have a table build going on in our shop right now. A uh, local family here in Tupelo was building a home. Um, they were partial to these trees that found themselves in the way of the home site. So rather than see those things go to a landfill, they partner with us. We sawmill their lumber. We kiln dry their lumber. And then now we're turning it into finished pieces to go back into their new home. That's really cool. Like, I think that's really neat. And I think that's something that more people would be interested in doing, particularly. I mean, it's a it's not a free resource to you. I mean, you had to pay to get it taken down or maybe Mother Nature took it down. I'm sure there may be a cost of getting it to you guys in Tupelo. But I mean, can people load up their lumber and their trucks or on a trailer and haul it to you from wherever they're listening to Good Things Chad? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, so we take material in here on our yard in Tupelo. Um, you know, if someone has, has a tree that has to come down and maybe they, you know, maybe they'd like to continue that story on. Uh, our clients are welcome to welcome to trailer uh, their raw material to us, whereby we can kiln dry it and process it, 
uh, process it, then kiln dry it, then turn it back over to them, or they could commission us to build pieces with the, with the material. Uh, we're also mobile in our operations, so our sawmill is highly portable, and we take it all over the state to process this special wood for clients. And I know you've got some fun clients from Tammy Wynette and others. Can you stick with us, Chad, and we can continue our Superior Artisan Wood Story? Sure, thanks. All righty, we'll stick with it. we got more with you, more with Chad coming up next here on Good Things. Out more, we're finding out more behind the work of Superior Artisan Wood in Tupelo. And joining us is one of the co-owners, Chad Fletcher, and I guess the founder. And Chad, we've got folks agreeing with you on our C Spire text line. Jason says, I see people in my neighborhood regularly throwing out beautiful willow and aspen trees, limbs or whatever that could be used for something else. It's so sad to see. And then Larry and Jackson says that your story is awesome with you guys are doing with the discarded lumber or I guess you know lumber that would have otherwise wound up in landfills he's a home builder and they use a lot of reclaimed lumber for accent walls islands and so much more and I hope if nothing else Chad today we're just waking people up to the um, opportunities that may be right there in their backyard with the lumber that may come down from trees that fall or they have uh, had they have taken down. What are some of the projects that you do? What's the most common that you guys there do at Superior Artisan Wood? I mean, is it just sawmilling in it for them to do something else or is it also you taking it and creating something? Yeah, so we do a, a, a little bit of everything in, in our operations. So, uh, you know, if, if, if someone has materials that they'd like to get sawmilled for, the, for their cells, for their own use, we can do that. We can also take and kiln dry the material so that it's dried and ready to work with and them to use. Um, we also sell products. So um, nearly everything we sell is urban, urban salvage type wood, like we're talking about. It's connected to a community or a story. So we retail those items to hobbyists and DIYers, as well as full-time makers within the state. And then we also often offer um, custom commission bells out of our shop. And is that how Tammy Wynette wound it up in your shop? And maybe she didn't, but I'm sure her people, or maybe you can share the story. I didn't realize that she had a home here in Itawama County, and um, she took part in some of your lumber. How did that come about? Yeah, so uh, so she was uh, raised in Itawamba County. A uh, family member of hers um, contacted us about a huge oak tree that had come down on the place. So obviously, and we, we hear this story so often in that, you know, this tree is on my family home place and I have a connection with it and, I, and, I, and, I, and I'd like to hang on to it and be able to do something with it. So um, the similar story to what we see quite often, and this was a, a really, really large uh, red oak tree, uh, so large so that we had to... We had to set up our mill on several sets of cinder blocks just to be able to kind of make the entry cut into the into the tree. But uh, it's always an honor to be able to salvage, you know, some significant type uh, wood, you know, that has a significance to the community or to a family or to our state. So um, Tammy Wynette is a good example. Um, let's see, recently we processed some red oaks, some of which are in furniture pieces now from a uh, uh, a woman who's currently 92 years old in Batesville, Mississippi, and she planted these trees years and years and years ago in her yard with the anticipation that she might one day be able to see them shade her house. So not only did she see that, but then when they got diseased and had to come down, she's also able to see these things processed and now into beautiful furniture pieces in people's homes here in North Mississippi. Oh. That is a good story, Chad. I mean, that is one. I mean, that's furniture that will be a legacy to go down, you know, the family tree, pun intended, for, you know, decades and decades to come. But I want to know about the story behind the disappointment of was your initial feeling after you tried to salvage the second largest popular on record in Pontotoc County. Tell me about that. Yeah, so we work closely with tree service guys, as you might imagine, and a local tree service uh, fellow here in our area um, was contracted to uh, take a sick tree down out of a yard there in Pontotoc, and it turns out it was the second largest poplar on record in Pontotoc County history. Uh, the tree at the base of it had a diameter of more than six feet. Um, so you can imagine our excitement and what we do and, and, and being able to kind of go in and work with a, a significant history uh, record book tree. And then um, 
On the other side of that, we were equally disappointed to find out that it was um, almost completely hollow on the inside of it. So, uh, but, you know, um, you you kind of make the best of what you're what you're dealt, and and so we we we, we figured we kind of owed it to that tree to do something with it. We felt as though we owed it to the tree itself, maybe even the community or even the state, and so we were able to salvage just some huge limbs from that thing, and uh, so we sawmilled those, um, kiln dried them. They actually wound up down. Um, in Laurel, uh, with Ben Napier's shop down there, those guys um, constructed some uh, benches for uh, the fire department down there. So if you can imagine our enjoyment now uh, on the backside of that project, having salvaged a, a significant historic tree out of Pontotoc County, um, made the best of what we had. We weren't sure what might come with it, but we knew we wanted to do something special. And then it stayed in Mississippi and went to Community Heroes down there in Laurel. And Jimmy, on our text line, Chad, says that you guys are rock stars, that you guys recently brought your sawmill to their farm and sawed about 20 trees for them to use in the construction of their home, and they would highly recommend you. So that is an unsolicited two thumbs up uh, from, from Jimmy there on the text line. I just, you know, I, I feel like I'm not the only one who didn't know that this was a thing that you could do. I'm, I'm sure I knew that, that it, you could if I really thought about it. But I hope we've at least planted the seed to, for folks to rethink, you know, trees that get discarded or things that can be done with them or, or made from them. And if you are a DIYer, then it feels like your shop would be, you know, a dreamboat to come and sort of shop and look. Do y'all have an actual storefront of any kind, Chad, or is it kind of like just a shop? How do we find you? Yeah, so yeah, so we have a, we have a showroom here in here in Tupelo. Um, folks can find us on website superiorartisanwood.com. If you do the Facebook, we're Superior Artisan Wood. Um, also Superior Artisan Wood on Instagram. So we invite hobbyists or DIYers to come peruse our inventory for their projects. Maybe they're knocking out a charcuterie board or a cutting board or maybe maybe a kitchen table or maybe looking for a mantelpiece. We also work with home builders and then professional makers, guys who do this every day for a living. Pretty cool. Okay, can you imagine doing anything else for a living, Chad? I mean, could you have written the story for yourself? Oh no, ma'am, not 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 even close. So it's it's uh, you know we we kind of stumbled upon it by accident, and my business partner Alan and I, and then uh, we have we have really found ourselves and found our connection to the world around us and the community we live in through our woodwork. Do you have any trees that came off? Of, well, you mentioned your home. So what did, did you use the lumber to actually build the home, or did you do special projects in your own home that got all of this started? Yeah, so it all got started with accent work in my home primarily, like porch, porch posts and exposed beams. I did some live edge vanity tops in the house. Um, I was able to salvage, at the time, I was able to salvage some uh, old American chestnut hand hewed beams from an old uh, homesteader cabin. We utilized those as kitchen shelving and mantelpieces in the home. So, uh, yeah, the, so the stuff in the home is kind of significant to me and close to my heart because that's kind of where we got started with it. Well, I love it, and I encourage everyone to rethink, you know, the woods around their house or if a tree falls during a storm or, as you mentioned, gets diseased and has to be taken down, that it can still have life and it can still not wind up in a landfill. That's still mind-boggling to me that that uh, good resource just gets thrown away when it could be used for so many, um, so many good things. Well, this was such a fun story, Chad. I appreciate your time here uh, on Good Things. Thanks for having us, Rebecca. I enjoyed my time with you. Now I'm thinking about what tree can I go chop down, Rhino, to have something sort of turned into it. I'll have to say I definitely am the sentimental type. And to hear the story of the lady who's now 92 years old who planted her trees and then watched them grow and do the best that they could for her and her home and then be able to transform that into something her family can continue to have to not only remember her by but also just her um thoughtfulness with growing the trees in the first place. It's just one of those things that you're just like, you can't make this stuff up. It's wonderful.